Well, well, good evening and uh, welcome to you all uh, for this evening presentation, the fourth in series two of the Grand Lords of Scotland's History and Heritage Group's presentations on the histories of our oldest lodges. And might I just at this early stage offer my thanks to uh, well, Charles Winston and well, Gordon Mickey for their technical expertise in, in making this happen. Thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to welcome uh, amongst us this evening is uh, Brother Magnus Lodges, who is the past master and secretary of Canongate and Leith, Leith and Canongate number five uh, presenter this evening. And we look forward to hearing his uh, presentation on the history of his lodge very shortly. Might I now just uh, make a very special warm welcome to our Grand Master Mason, Brother Ramsey McGee, uh, for his. Uh, attendance this evening, uh, as is usual uh, for a Grand Master Mason. The support of these presentations from the outset has been tremendous and very encouraging to us all. Thank you, sir, and again, I hope uh, you enjoy this evening's presentation, as we all, I'm sure, will do. Uh, let me now introduce the members of the History and Heritage Group who are with us this evening. Uh, Brother Tom Jessup, Brother Charles Winson, Brother Alistair Henderson, uh, Brother Dr. Uh, Douglas Nicholl, Brother Gordon Mickey, Brother uh, Colin Arthur, our latest recruit to the uh, to the ranks of the History and Heritage Group. So uh, there's only one brother, uh, one brother who couldn't make it this evening, Brother Nicholas Scobie, uh, but the others are here in support of the uh, presentation this evening. Well, I might just mention that uh, I'm actually here, uh, John. I didn't see you there. Welcome, sir. My apologies for uh, uh, suggesting. You weren't there. Quite all right. Uh, welcome. Well, my apologies, Father Nicholas Scobie is here. Uh, well, tonight's presentation, as always, will be recorded uh, and available tomorrow for review, should you so wish to do, or perhaps mention to others who could make it along this evening. And at this stage, well, I would ask you if you would please just to remain uh, muted this evening. Uh, the question and answer session will follow the presentation. Uh, if you do have any questions as uh, we, we move uh, onward through the, the presentation, Bill, uh, please log it into the chat box and we'll get to it uh, following the presentation. And I would now at this stage ask our uh, uh, Grand Master Mason, Brother Ramsey McGee, if you're good enough, sir, to uh, introduce our speaker this evening. Thank you, sir. Thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. An absolute pleasure to see you all. We've got 68 with us tonight, which is first class. Um, for this, the, well, John said the fourth in this series, but the ninth uh, and the series overall. And uh, it's been a tremendous success. And tonight, I have no doubt, will be an equal success. I was expecting to introduce a, a double act tonight, but things have changed once again. And Brother Magnus Burgess is going to be our sole presenter this evening. Magnus was Initiated into the Lodge, Canongate and Leith, Leith and Canongate number five, in 2003. He's been the master of the Lodge on two occasions, in 2015 and 2016. Uh, Magnus is also an honorary member of Lodges Trafalgar and Lodge Trinity. Uh, he has two sons, both in the craft, uh, both members of number five, and he had the, the privilege and pleasure of witnessing uh, his youngest son's initiation uh, into the Lodge last September. So it's good to make up with uh, Magnus again this evening. I should add that Magnus is also a member of Lodge Naval and Military. So can I now introduce you to him and I am sure we'll have another excellent night uh, with the, the history of Lodge Canongate and Leith, Leith and Canongate number five. Thank you. You're muted, John. Thank you, Charles. Now, I was just thanking you, Grand Master Mason for his introduction there. Um, thank you, sir. And I would now uh, again uh, extend a welcome to uh, Brother Magnus Burgess, who will undertake his presentation on number five this evening. So, Brother Magnus, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Brother John. 
Could I have the first slide, please? Most first of all, Grandmaster Mason, Brother Ramsey McGee, William Ramsey McGee, Brother Chairman, Brother Secretary, Brethren of the Histories and Heritage Committee, Distinguished Brethren, Brother Noel. Most first of all, Grandmaster, I thank you for your kind introduction. And to the History and Heritage Committee, I thank you for asking number five to present a presentation on our history. And I, I hope you find this presentation interesting and informative. It was into a troubled world that Canongate and Leith, Leith and Canongate, was born. We begin our story in 1688, where we find ourselves surrounded by an atmosphere of tension and strife. The whole nation was torn apart by the religious partisanships and King James II, who had been crowned only three years earlier, was disposed and exiled. Not only perspectives to Edinburgh and her surrounding districts. It appears that the populace were upset by the local troubles in addition to what was going on nationally. The powerful purchases in the trade guilds of the capital were gravely anxious and concerned by the activities of craftsmen and merchants of the neighbouring boroughs. And measures were being taken to confine the practices of these industrious individuals, notably from Carnegie and those from Leith to their own precincts. Focusing on the affairs of one section of the community, the operative masons, it is clear that the Masonic craft had not escaped the ailments of the common of any other trades, that several masons of Canongate and of Leaf having surveyed the positions as members of the Lodge of Edinburgh, and having found it unsatisfactory, had boldly resolved to succeed and form an independent body. This lodge was to be named Canongate and Leith, Leith and Canongate, and it is her life story that forms a subject of this presentation this evening. The Lodge of Edinburgh did not welcome this of, of her first offspring and promptly expelled those her members who had dared to meet among themselves without any parental authority. However, despite the stern edict of her mother lodge, these masons of Leith and Canongate proved themselves to be men of initiative and of courage by continuing to operate as a separate and was later proved to be a properly constituted lodge. The Lodge of Edinburgh showed their own disapproval that these actions, and on St John's night, the members at the meeting in Mary's Chapel, given a grave indictment against these rebels. We can only imagine of the indignation that was matter was discussed on this evening. Suffice to say that the successionists were outlawed and in her own records, the Lodge of Edinburgh left no doubt as to her own attitude towards the offenders. The minutes of this historic meeting are incredibly important and, and are read. Edinburgh, the 27th of December, 1688, which day the deacons and masters, having considered the contentious desertion and division raised by brother Alexander Bear the Older, George Rankin, David Ellison, James Walker, John Brooke, Masons of Leith, and John Hutchinson, Robert Thompson, and Alexander Bear the Younger, Masons of North Leith and the Canongate. With the adherence who's contravened to all customs, laws, and reasons, and to contravene to the Masons' law itself, have been presumably used in liberty to meet amongst themselves and born and to pass work and having to invoke a lodge amongst themselves to the great contempt of whole society without the rules or, or have wardens of authority be start or an ordain and that henceforth neither of these above persons or their adherents or that who have entered or shall have entered or pass among them be admitted to work within the freedoms as journeymen with the satisfaction that any of these masters shall be assumed to employ any of these persons or their descendants from them until deacons or most part of the masters be satisfied that they pay a sum of 10, 10 pounds beside what is their punishment, the house shall be placed that to inflict by another 
and where as they, these journeymen shall be struck off and not belong to this laws, contrary to the laws of masons and being barred and being employed by any deacon or mason of this lodge. It is with this justifiable pride and number five has this positive evidence of her existence. And we thank the Lodge of Edinburgh who have furnished her daughter lodge with a copy of these minutes. From this time onwards, Lodge Canningate and Leith, Leith and Canningate was fully established as an independent body. Unfortunately, details of her work prior to the erection of the Grand Lodge in 1736 are lacking, but her proceedings must have been contingent constitutionally and faithfully recorded because in 1738, her scrutiny of her books by the Grand Lodge granted her a chapter without any hesitation. But why are we called Canningate and Leith, Leith and Canningate? Well, in 1938, on this occasion, our, our Queen Jubilee, a brother James Mackenzie passed master a solicitor while proposing the toast to the Lodge. He advanced a theory that was feasible at the time Leith and the Canningate were separate guilds from Edinburgh. And in the 17th century, the guilds would suffer oppression at the hands of their neighbours in Edinburgh. It was suggested that the guilds of Leith and Canningate had the common ground and would we meet within each other's districts. As no one would have any precedence over each other, it was thought we'd called Canningate and Leith, Leith and Canningate. Can I have the next slide, please? In 1715, there is first mention of her lodge rooms. It was in this Brown's entry on the Canningate. This building was demolished in 1932. During 1736, an election of the Grand Master of every lodge was invited to attend, apart from number five. As the Lodge of Edinburgh still refused to recognise her renegade daughter, as she still carried great influence over other lodges who followed suit and not to recognise us as a lawful lodge. By October, arrangements for a grand election were well in hand. And on the 15th of that month, a letter was framed by a joint committee of four promoting lodges and dispatched to all lodges in Scotland with the exception of Holyrood House in Canningate and Leith, inviting them to the election meeting to be held on St Andrew's Day of William St Clair of Roslyn was then raised as a Grand Master in Lodge Canningate Colwinning on the 22nd of November. The first grand election meeting took place in Mary's Chapel on the 30th of November 1736 and it was attended by 33 lodges with her masters and wardens in attendance. Immediately after the entry of the lodges the proceedings were Brought, brought to a dramatic interruption by an, an objection laid by Lodge of Edinburgh to the presence of Canningate and Leith, Leith and Canningate, at which the presence of the Lodge was stated to be a Lodge without authority and was unconstitutional, without authority and was unconstitutional, and therefore could claim no right of interest in this election. This last effort to prevent the Lodge taking part which was more than 50 years old at this time, was fruitless. Her master, Brother James White, supported by his wardens, immediately defended the status of the lodge and offered to produce there and then evidence of her existence since 1688. Being armed with such proof, the opinion of the assembled brethren was solicited and a vote of objection was overruled and put into the minutes of the Grand Lodge. A temporary role of the Grand Lodge was compiled and we were given the Lodge number eight, with Kilwin and Leith being number five. It wasn't until that Lodge ceased to exist that we were awarded number five. The Mother Lodge eventually softened and more likely kindly to her daughter Lodge and on St John's Day in 1738, exactly 50 years since her, exp her expulsion, she formally received into Mary's Chapel as her daughter lodge. In 1745, the political atmosphere in Edinburgh changed by the coming of one Prince Charles Edward Stuart and his army. 
One brother of number five, brother Marmaduke McBeef, was a rebel. He was a gunsmith and a gunpowder maker and threw in with the young prince. The king's men were alerted and his name was put on the list of rebels by a local surveyor of excise, a Mr. Edward Winville. Brother McBeef was to become the master of number five, but unfortunately many years later he died in Perninary. Ironically, the excise men who named him Brother Marmaduke as a rebel was later initiated into the craft of the Lord's Canon Great King Winning, number two. In 1764, the Grand Lodge granted permission to change her name to Canongate St. Patrick. No one knows why this was done. But there was a fashion for lodges to be called after saints in these days, but within five years we were later back to Canongate and Leith, Leith and Canongate. It is not known why we were even chosen in the name of a Hibernian saint. With the lodge now back under the bosom of her mother, Things were starting to thrive in her relationship with her neighbours in number two were more cordial, as you would expect with two lodges situated within the Canongate. Can we next slide, please? Moving on to the 1800s, number five would meet again in the taverns and hotels of both Leith and Edinburgh. The first account of number five meeting in lodge rooms in Leith is in Constitutional Corp, now number 86, Constitution Street. In 1830, and we met there until 1921, paying a rent of two pounds and ten shillings. In January 1846, saw so number five again, starting to hold meetings outside of Leith for the first time in many years. We were to meet in the Crown and Anchor Tavern and also in the Tough Hotel, number three, Princess Street, which was later to become known as the North British Hotel. It is noted that the meetings in Edinburgh did not bring any apparent improvement to the finances of the lodge, so they were then discontinued after about a year. We even had our own circus at number five, with brother Thomas Cook, the founder of Cook's Circus, as being a member. We also had a lion tamer, clowns, acrobats, and we even had our own strongman. Brother Cook was initiated in 1846, and members of the Cook family were to become members over the coming years. On the 3rd of May, 1888, we celebrated the bicentenary by the lodge rooms were being too small to hold the celebration. So permission was then granted to use Duke Street Halls, the Grand Master Brother Colonel Sir Archibald Campbell of Blythewood and 37 deputations being in attendance. We are now dipping our toes into the 1900s. Queen Victoria was to pass in 1901, and even Buffalo Bill Cody was to make an appearance in Leith. In that same year, in O, and Hibs were to win the Scottish Cup in 1902, the last time this famous trophy was to be in Leith for over 114 years. Through to the 1900s, with us being a seafaring port, and of the 380 candidates we initiated, 97 brethren who followed the life of the sea these brethren included captains from Copenhagen, Lerwick, Oslo and Cronenberg. There were also many brethren from New Zealand, West Indies and the Baltics and also of Northern Europe. Can I have the next slide please? And so dentally, it was said that at one time number five had more members than any other lodge within the province of Denver. However, number five were not immune to loss. Brother John Berlin was the right washroom master from 1900 to 1903, and he decided to emigrate to the USA and served the craft in America for over 50 years. Brother, Brother Berlin was a stalwart within number five, and him leaving left a big hole. His parting gift was his marble pedestal that stood in the lodge until we lost our premises. This beautiful pedestal was now in pound broken in storage in 2016. It could not be repaired, so unfortunately, we had to scrap it. Around this time, we find the names of some of the most eminent brethren affiliating to number five. Major William Hamilton Ramsey of Garton, Wright Washful Grand Junior Warden. R.F. Shaw, Stuart of Greenock, number 12, Wright Washful Substitute Grand Master. Provincial Grand Masters of Dumbartonshire, Peoplesheard and Selkirk, 
in Lanarkshire Upper, John Harvey, the Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of England, England, Grand Secretary of Canada, and finally, Right Honourable Lord Rosehill, Right Worshipful Grand Warden, to name but a few. As the first part of the century, the amendment then we move on to what was known as the First World War, was to start in 1914. And as with many other lodges, brethren of number five who were, to take, who were to be taken part in this conflict. A roll of honour was completed in 1918, showing the names of the 87 brethren who served their country and of this 17 who made the ultimate sacrifice. Next slide, please. During his service in the Navy, we come across the name of Harry L. Martin. Initiated into Carnegie Leith in 1918, at first he just seems to be someone from another Navy serviceman joining a lodge. But upon further research, it became apparent that this brother was one of the most eminent Freemasons in Canada. Canadian born, he was to become the Grand Master of Canada from 1953 until 1957. And he was to pass in 1976, leaving a legacy behind in his homeland after being heavily involved in starting the blood transfusion service there. I would like to think that his mother lodge in some way installed the values of the craft upon him. After the war, the lodge was standing and it was very busy with initiates from the Navy and from the Merchant Navy. At the time we were searching, serving in this port, it was noted that the lodge rooms were starting to show a lot of wear and tear. So a proposal was made that we should find new premises. On February, the 20, the, in February 1921, the premises of 56 Queen's Charles Street was up for sale for a sum of 1000 £520. So in April, the committee offered 1300 and this was accepted on April the 25th, 1921. Next slide, please. The first lodge meeting of Queen Charlotte Street took place on the 4th of September, 1923, with the new lodge looking pristine, and with Brother Bolin's pedestal in the centre, the brethren were standing with pride in what they had accomplished. Temple was officially opened on the 20th of September 1923 by Brother James Watson, past master of St. David's, number 36, at this time the chairman of the Metropolitan District, and he was accompanied by many distinguished brethren of the Grand Lodge. As we move through to the 20s and 30s, the Lodge was to go from strength to strength, with golf, bowling, fishing sections, annual balls, and the Burns Nights were always eagerly awaited on. Then there again we were found ourselves in war in 1939 and again the brethren who were to step up and fight for their country. Some 128 brethren were to serve and 37 were to make the ultimate sacrifice. These brethren were then added to our role of honour. Next slide please. In 1943, the well-known music hall comedian, I belong to Glasgow fame, Brother Wolf, Wolf Fife, was made an honorary member of number five, for his services to the fundraising from all armed forces within Leaf, etc. And it was sad that he was to pass away some three years later, leaving the brethren of number five devastated, as I can see he was a real liked and respect respected brother. The beginning of our minutes of 18, 1989 make it clear that we face significant financial issues. And over the course of the next couple of years, a great deal of work was carried out to understand what was happening. Regretfully, these issues now we were lost their building in Queen Charlotte Street in November 1991. We had sold the lodge and we moved the lodge to Trafalgar 223 in the building of St. 1 St. Andrew's Place in Leith. And the minutes advised that the number of brethren continued to be healthy, but even though we had a huge number of brethren a new lodge, many did not want to come back when Queen Charlotte Street was sold. After a number of years, we then moved to one St. Clair Place, home of what was then Scotia Regia, 1345. And of course, now Scotia Trinity, 885. And we quickly settled there and had, had a number of great evenings. As all things do come to an end, and we now decided to leave St. Clair's Place and move on to in February 2018 to Fickett Street, Portobello, home of Portobello Lodge 226. 
a move which caused a little bit of controversy within the province, the provincial Grand Lodge, as technically the lodge is now meeting the province of Midlothian. We've had some ups and downs over the last few years, but we have continued to initiate new members. And more importantly, we, have, we are seeing a lot of them coming back to our meetings, and in some cases taking office. We recently initiated two Lewises, and it was that a great pleasure that the most worshipful Grand Master Mason was in attendance to welcome them into Freemasonry. We've also got some really good younger brethren in offices who are making a huge contribution, and we couldn't be prouder what our hopes are for the future. It goes without saying that we like number five to continue in perpetuity, or maybe until the polar ice caps have, have actually melted. This is the end of what my bit of this presentation, and I hope I have given you a small taste of what number five is all about. But can I leave you with this interesting trivia, maybe even in your next quiz night? The mallet used by your right washroom master is a piece of oak from the house of Mary of Dees, the mother of Mary, Queen of Scots. Her mortal remains the disinterred in Inchkeep Island in the Forth. The warden's mallets are from the last sailing ship's timbers to leave Leith. The director of ceremonies battens are made from the old wooden gates on the old Albert docks. The lodge banner is from 1844, which has just been found again and is now displayed at every lodge night. The Harmony Bell was presented by the Royal Navy base at Port Edgar after the First World War in memory of the brethren who gave their lives. And it was rung at 10 p.m. every evening for the meeting for the absent brethren. Brethren, that is the end of my presentation, and I thought I hope you found it informative. Thank you, Magnus, for your very well researched and presented uh, history of uh, number five. And uh, just before I, I, I hand over to uh, Brother Charles Wilson, who will host the uh, question and answer session. Can I just uh, make mention that I, I was very intrigued with your explanations of the early, early relationships uh, which your lodge, your lodge had with the Lodge of Edinburgh. Some difficult times, I think, but uh, it was heartening to hear how this was overcome over the years. A good example of how hard, how hard work and patience will overcome such difficulties. Well done, Magnus. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Thank you, John. And I would now invite uh, my brother Charles Winston, if you're good enough, you now to host the question and answer session. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, brethren, if you could write any of your uh, questions, or indeed if you just raise your hand uh, if you would like to speak. Uh, Magnus, uh, I know you've put a huge amount of work into this this evening, and uh, I think we're all very grateful for the huge amount of work that you've done. I know how much of an effort you've, you've put in. You mentioned uh, from the minutes of the Lodge of Edinburgh, Alexander Baer the Older and George Rankin um, and others. W w these in fact then were your founding members, I take it? They were in fact, yeah. Uh, as I said, the, the, the first were actually were members of the guild from the Canning Gate. The other one were members of the guild in Leith. As you can see, John Baer the Older son was actually and the guild in Leith. So they were our founder members. They were the ones that decided to leave the Lodge of Edinburgh. And perhaps on a, on a less serious point, your lodge has an exceptionally long name. And I wonder whether or not, you know, secretaries over the centuries might have, you know, might have kind of commented on the fact that they have to write this name in every minute. What we get all the time is Leith and Canongate Canongate and Leith instead of Canongate and Leith, Leith and Canongate. They get it wrong. They get it always put the, the wrong way around. It seems to happen all the time and you sit there, especially when I was a master in the chair, you sit there and you just go, right. And I also noted that you mentioned that the Lodge changed its name briefly for a period of about five years to Canon Gate St. Patrick. No one knows why, because at the time, if you look at the books, you've got, you had St. Giles, you had St. John's, you've got St. James. It just seemed to be, it, when I researched it, it, there were a lot of St. Lodges, so it must have been like a common thing in the days, same as people have 
stuff now is you know, let's all jump on the bandwagon. They decided to change the St. Patrick, which was a, hopefully, I'm myself being a high burning supporter, it looked quite good, but they quickly changed it back. The other thing I, can, I could say was, Canongate and Leith, Leith and Canongate is, people would call it maroon, it would colours. We call it, it's actually crimson. And I always get from the heart supporters, what is a Leith Lodge doing with heart and melody and colours? And I always say, Canongate and Leith, Leith and Canongate was 1688. Heart and Midlothian was 1874. So Heart and Midlothian wears Canongate and Leith colours, not Heart and Midlothian colours. You're quite right, quite right. So would you say that being in Leith, um, a port um, has had a major impact on the lodge? Definitely. From a naval perspective? Definitely. Always, I had to, when you talk to a lot of the old masters, it was like Canning and Leith had the Dockers. Trafalgar really had the Royal Navy, and Trinity, Trinity kind of had both. But Canning and Leith kind of had the Dockers of the docks in the lodge. You find there was quite a few there. Brother Al, Sir Henderson, you had your hand up. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Magnus, for your, your talk. You mentioned at the end, you know, trivial information. Can I maybe just add to that? You mentioned about Will Fife. Yes. Uh, his grandson uh, is a personal friend of mine. His name is William Cam Cameron Fife Stewart. And uh, Will Fife, of course, died in very tragic circumstances. He, he fell off From the window in Dundee. At the uh, Rusax Hotel in St Andrews. Um, uh, he was a member of 571 in Glasgow Dramatic, uh, but also the length of the, the title of your lodge in Glasgow, of course, we would claim that we have one of the, we have the longest name of any lodge in the Scottish Constitution, the Bridgeton and Glasgow Shamrock and Thistle Lodge 275, but uh, that's for another day, perhaps, if somebody wants to count the letters or the, the name. <laughs> anyway, just a little bit of more kind of trivial information. But thank oh, you very much for your presentation. Yeah. And Brother, Brother, Will Fife, Brother Will Fife's mother lodge, I think, was uh, Shots. Uh -huh. yeah, remember I think Shots, I think, was his mother lodge. Yeah. yeah. Do, do we have any other questions, Brother? Charles. Um, uh, Oh, Mike Magnus, you said around the 1900s, a good few Masonic notables or, or the good and the great of the craft at the time affiliated. Yeah. Do you know why they chose to affiliate to number five? No, I've, as I said, I've got this book here, which is, gives you great detail about the history of number five, but it doesn't mention why so many eminent brethren, it must have just been another fashion thing like the saints, but they just... In the area, it seemed that we had, they were all coming in their droves to join number five. I don't know if the drink was cheaper or something like that, or the rum was coming in the port or something like that. I don't know, but they all seemed to come to number five. Okay, thank you, Magnus. I did have another question, but I think Charles uh, asked it a similar way, so thank you. And was that the one about the mariners and shipmates? That's the one. Yeah, again. And, and again, I've got a reference back to this book. It actually gives the names of them, and uh, there was quite a few. I, I only, I only originally I had the names in, but this, the presentation would have went on longer and longer, so I didn't put any names. But uh, there was quite a few. There was, I'm talking about sixty odds, something like that, who were all captains. I do believe someone says that number five used to do meetings out in the sea. And Grand Lodge, the rumour was that Grand Lodge actually wound them back in and said you can't do that at the time, I believe. We have a, a question from uh, Brother Colin Arthur um, about the crest on the first slide, so I'll put it back up. Um, yeah, my, my question was, um, it's a very nice uh, crest. Um, the the ships on the, the right-hand side, um, presumably the, they relate to Leith. Um, yes, and the, the stag's what, head, the stag's yes. at the Canning Gate. 
if you go down to the Canning Gate, the, the Kirk and Canning Gate, you see the stag, it's still on top of the, as you go down the bottom of the Canning Gate, the Kirk there has got the stag's head up there. That represents the Canning Gate, and the ships obviously represent Leith. Right. This, this, this emblem is still on the premises in Queen Charlotte Street. It's now, uh, they do weddings and things like that. And if, it looks great. They've kept his emblem still, which it is today. It looks really good. Mm. But uh, it's just a reminder every time you go go past uh, Queen Charlotte Street, you look and it, it just. Obviously, I wasn't. I went. I never. I was never in Queen Charlotte Street when it was a lodge. But I have been there in, on a on another on another occasion as a wedding. But I can only imagine what it was like at the time. This lodge. It's a beautiful, beautiful building. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much for that. No problem. Can I just, uh, Charles, if I can interrupt, can I just ask a, a question of Magnus? Uh, the the book that, that you have there, the history of the lodge, it's yes. clearly in uh, short supply. Would you know if there's an electronic copy of that book to be had? I wouldn't think so, because it was made by, uh, it was printed by the printers when Morrison and Gibb, and they, they were in McDonald Road. They're a long time gone, so mm -hmm. I wouldn't think there was any more transcripts about. But I do know there's one, someone, in, as I said, someone in South Africa has got a signed copy. And they're selling it for about 50, 60 pounds. But you can go on Amazon and get this book for about, I think I got mine for about 10 pounds. And I can assure you, it's, it's some reading if you want to know the history, not just of Canning and Leith, but of Scottish Freemasonry in general at the time. It is really, really good. Really good. I could have, as I said, I could have had hundreds and loads and loads of information, but I can't, I can't overload you, which I tried, Charles. <laughs> now I'm looking for a copy for the the library in the Provincial Grand Lodge of Renfrewshire East and uh, either a hard copy or an electronic copy would yeah. be very welcome but we'll continue our searches. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I don't believe we have uh, any more questions Mr Chairman. Can I hand it back to you? Thank you Charles. Yes, thank you Brian for uh, uh, all your questions and thank you for the proficient manner in which you answered them all. Magnus, well done sir. Well done. Thank you. Uh, I wonder now if I can invite uh, the Grand Master Mason again to, to the fore and just uh, perhaps just say a few words before, before we Thank close. Thank you very much, John. Very kind. Uh, Magnus, congratulations on a, an excellent presentation this evening. I found it uh, immensely interesting, especially the fact that at one point uh, you were number eight, uh, because I think next week we'll hear about number eight again. Uh, up in Inverness, so the, the, it's very, very interesting to see how the numbers were were swapped around and uh, changed around. Uh, the it's whole the same, Grandmaster. Oh, well, always, we always wondered why we were number five and we were older than number four. But last week, I last week, I now found out why they got <laughs> number four. <laughs> yeah, and that, that that's been one of the the beauties of the whole series. Yeah. Uh, we've learned things about each of the the, the lodges. And again, tonight, I found it uh, very, very interesting how there was this uh, interaction between the, the lodges, sometimes not just uh, in the, the, the best of ways, but uh, it was very interesting nevertheless. So can I thank you, Magnus, on behalf of all the, the, the brethren who were present tonight. I see about 69 now, but I think we're up at 75 at one point. So can I thank you on behalf of everyone for yet another very, very interesting presentation. Uh, the, the whole series has been outstanding and we look forward with great anticipation to the final one next uh, Wednesday night. So thank you very much, Magnus. Thank you, Grandmaster Mason. Thank you, uh, Grandmaster Mason, for those, uh, those uh, final remarks. And uh, I must say that I was surprised that given the, the hint earlier about uh, the emblem of the Lodge, uh, showing staggies. I'm just so surprised you made no mention of uh, your loyalty to uh, a more northern lot of staggies, but you resisted it well, sir. Well done. Well, our next uh, uh, presentation will be a week tonight. That'll be the 7th uh, of October at 7 p.m. And on that occasion, the brother Alex Crave, the past master uh, of Old Inverness co-winning St. John's, number six, will undertake a presentation on the history of that fine old lodge. And I do hope, uh, brethren, that um, you get it into your diaries because I can guarantee you another excellent 
presentation and a history of that fine old lodge up there in Inverness. Um, so unless anybody has any other points they would wish to add at this time, uh, I would uh, thank you all for your support this evening and do hope that you're able to join us again next week. And in the meantime, um, live quietly and stay distant and stay safe. Thank you, brother. Brother, and if you'd like to unmute and uh, say goodbye. Yeah, well done, Magnig. Excellent presentation. Um, good Magnus. Very good. Well done, Magnus. Well done, Magnus. Well done, Magnus. Superb. It's enjoyable. Magnus. Hi. It's very informative. Thank you, Magnus. Well done, Magnus. Excellent. Magnus. Superb. Thank you, Magnus. Excellent. Well done, Magnus. Thank you. Up to you, Magnus. Well done, Magnus. Thank you, Magnus. Take care, Brian. Thank you very much indeed. Very informative. Thank you. Good night, brethren. Thank you very much. Well done. Good night, brethren. Good night.